Well, we can start now. Um, welcome, Kathy Richards. Uh, she's going to be the next presenter for this uh, session. So, Kathy. Thank you, Arturo. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kathy, and I'm currently at the engine room. Um, but for the last six months, I've been a Green Web Fellow. Um, and my topic of investigation was broadly GIS. I'm going to walk you through a little bit of what the last six months have looked like for me. Um, I mean, we could talk about it more <laughs> later. Um, but yeah, so I kind of wanted to look at how can we use uh, GIS responsibly. Um, first off, um, maps have served as authoritative and trustworthy sources of geospatial information for years. So that was actually one of the findings. Um, essentially, for some reason, humans psychologically trust maps more than anything else. You show them a chart, and they're like, OK, maybe. Maybe it looks like what I've seen in real life. But you show people a map, and they're like, this checks out. I'm going to follow it. <laughs> there are some theories, obviously. One is that usually when you get a map, it's for an area that you don't know. Um, so you're not, you don't need a map to like walk around the town that you grew up in, right? You need a map when you come to Puebla, and you're not from Puebla, for example. Um, the other is that maps came to be around the same time as scientific knowledge. So there's potentially some colonialism there, but we don't get into that. Um, but yeah, essentially that you know, connection with scientific knowledge and making maps and you know, the colonization um, kind of made people psychologically trust maps more than we normally do. However, one of the big things too is that maps are becoming easier to make. Um, every couple of months there's a new platform, along with pretty much everything that we have, AI is everywhere, there's a new platform to make it easier to do X. Um, and maps are no exception, right? Um, so I'll talk about that in a bit. And so my question was, how can we use geospatial information systems responsibly and ethically for environmental and climate justice? And so I had some things that I already knew. Like I said, maps are becoming easier to make, so many different platforms. But I also knew that like, the data sets that maps use were a little bit more complex than CSV files, right? Sometimes it can have the zip file with a lot of things inside. But then I also had some assumptions, some which were proven wrong and others <laughs> like in between. Um, one that was there's a knowledge gap, right, between the people that are at organizations and they might even be the intern. And they're like, can you make a map next week for the gala or whatever? Um, so, you know, there was an assumption that there's a knowledge gap with some people. Um, and then the other one was that the platforms are hard to use, um, really difficult to use. I will say that to run one of the most more popular softwares, um, I actually had to get a brand new computer um, and check out the specs. And I was like, this used to be fun, but not anymore. <laughs> I just want it to work. So um, I guess I saw a chopportunity. That's a new word that I learned today. Um, and I thought, what if we just you know, investigate this, draw up some guidance? And so I kind of had a plan. Um, one was obviously investigating the utility of GIS um, in promoting you know, uh, digital rights and environmental justice analyzing the ethical and security risks, proposing community-centered guidance. Um, and I will say, I'll stop there very quickly, because one of the big things for me is that it should be accessible. I didn't want it to be technical in any way. It should be accessible by many audiences. Um, yeah, et cetera. Um, and then the last bit, facilitating external cohort knowledge exchanges. I will say I did not get to that, because six months is really short. But that's next. Um, and so some of the findings. So one of the ones that I didn't expect to find was the one, kind of the market itself of GIS experts, right? Um, one of the big ones was that they, at least they feel and like kind of sense it too from the job postings that I saw, that there's a devalued skill set. Um, sometimes you would have a GIS analyst job posting and a regular analyst job posting, and the difference would be in the tens of thousands of dollars. Um, to me, I mean, I'm a you know, data person by trade. I would look at the job posting and think, this is just as hard. <laughs> it's not any easier. I don't understand why they're you know, being offered sometimes even half. It, you know, the difference is really stark. Um, and you know, from that, I, I jumped into a lot of GIS expert communities. And generally, of course, they're going to be happy. I'm um, sorry, frustrated um, by their devalued skill sets. They're like, we actually do something that's really important. This is a hard thing to do. Um, but you keep offering us really, really low salaries. Um, they're also alarmed, like the experts are alarmed by the mistakes that they see non-trained um, people make, um, and we'll get into that in a bit. Um, and generally have found that they steer people away from getting degrees in GIS. Um, 
and I'll, I'll touch upon why. The training is inadequate. Um, a lot of the GIS degrees out there, I won't say all of them, but a lot of them, talk and like they train you on the platform, but not on the underlying geographic things that you need to use a platform. So a little bit of techno solutionism. Um, it's fine, just upload it into this platform. You'll get the map that you need. Um, but yeah, they don't receive training in geography. So it, this is why a lot of people are making mistakes, at least those that have the GIS degrees. And then of course, there's a whole, quite often in the same communities, a lot of people would come in, they're like, I'm the product manager. I need to make a map. Can you help me? How do I do this? So quite a huge disconnect there. And so I was able to find, well, get from the experts some of the more common errors that happen. Um, some of them are done by accident, like I said, lack of knowledge. Some on purpose, depending on who's making it. Um, and others due to the GIS algorithms themselves. Um, so some of these common errors are the normalization one. I think, I don't know the people, I'm not sure if the person's here. Um, but the normalization issue, right? Um, quite often, these platforms don't have the advanced data analysis to let you normalize your data in the sense of let's say 100 COVID cases per 200 people versus 100 cases per 1,000 people. That changes things. And quite a lot of platforms, they don't let you do those little tweaks. Um, you just upload the data and call it a day, and it looks good. Um, but when you do that, it's just a map of the population. <laughs> it's not an actual map of like COVID cases or whatever it might be. The second one is grouping. Um, for those that live in the US or have heard about the US, um, and politics, um, what, that's one of the big things that they do in the US, and it kind of, it's not really, it's called enumeration, I use grouping for the sake, um, but it's around how we split up the communities. Um, and so in the US, for example, they purposely split up communities so that the African American vote is diminished, or like the, the power of the African American vote is diminished, um, but the same thing can happen with like environmental justice. Um, found a couple resources where they talked about yeah, there's been instances of people splitting the communities up so that it doesn't look like the oil spill was that bad or like the asthma rates or the disease rates are that bad. And then the last one is around inferences. Um, and that's around, you know, one of the big things of using GIS, but not just GIS to make a map, but GIS for environmental justice is that you're combining it with human data. And so quite often, as we all know, uh, these data sets are not at the same level. You might have a regional level, and then a county level, or whatever it might be. Um, and one of the things that happens quite often is people start to make inferences at different levels. So because you know you combine the two things, you just <laughs> substitute whichever one. Um, so yeah, that's one of the ma major ones. The other one that kind of put me into a tailspin uh, was time. Quite often, um, a lot of the experts would say that GIS doesn't do time well. I was like, what does that mean, though? And so, you know, I had my Dr. Strange moment. I do love time travel, so it was pretty cool for me. But I still was like, I have a fellowship project to finish, so just tell me what it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, so basically what they meant is like, it doesn't cover the lived experience of, of being human and moving around and not just staying in one place. Um, I guess they call it depending, et cetera. Um, but a lot of feminist geographers have also kind of covered this. You know, we don't spend our, ent like, our entire time at home. You know, we go to school, we spend a lot of time there, or we go to work, we spend a lot of time there as well. And GIS systems don't do a very good job of covering that movement or just of being human. Um, the assumption is often that, like, you know, if you got sick, you got sick at home, but what about if you went to school or work at this building, there was an environmental hazard there, what about that? That's quite often not, not something that GIS can do well. There are some platforms that do do it, but they're not for beginners in any way. So next one, so I will say one of the things that I'm actually not super proud of, I kind of went into this thinking that the GIS platforms were neutral. I don't know why I would think that. Um, but you know, one of the big things, and I had this quote, um, digital mapping tools such as GIS technologies and Google Earth are founded within Western um, epistemologies and perpetuate the colonial gaze and power inequity. And so, Generally, that's one of the things that I found throughout the different platforms, um, as you can expect. They're often skewed in, one, skewed in one direction or, you know, have all these things, but I'll walk you through it. Um, I've more or less put them into two categories. They don't necessarily only fall into those two categories, but it just made it easier. One was that um, the 
platforms that were significantly easier to use, just like upload your data and call it a day, um, they often only used US models of the Earth. <laughs> I'll head nod there. Um, so yeah, the US models, that's problematic, as you can imagine. Um, one of the really popular ones from the last a couple of months, maybe a year, um, their big pitch is like, we make mapping easy, um, and pretty and fun and all these things. Um, however, when I look into the documentation, they don't accept UTM models. They don't accept UTM models, which are used by quite a lot of the global south. Um, quite often, they don't have spatial analysis, and they don't have any privacy enhancing tools. They might have like a data privacy policy or you know security, but that's where it stops. Um, but at the other end, uh, the more the bigger systems, QGIS, which many know already, and Esri's ArcGIS, um, they have most models of the Earth in the thousands, um, and we'll talk about the models afterwards. Um, they do have spatial analysis, um, and they quite a few of them actually have like um, plugins. Well, sorry, actually, let me walk that back. QGIS has plugins uh, in order to kind of anonymize people's data, make it more private, kind of do all these things that I kind of talk, uh, you know, avoid the mistakes that I talked about before. Um, so yeah, so they kind of go into both those categories. As you can imagine, though, if you're being thrown into the situation, you're probably going to go for the tool that's easier to use. Um, so there's con definitely concerns around that. Essentially. As I, I did, I did keep the promise of making the guide. Um, you can go to it there. Um, the big thing with this guide is that it's open. Um, so I hope that if you guys read something and you're like, that's not intelligible, this makes no sense, please correct me. Because like I said, the big thing is that it's something that's understandable and accessible. Um, uh, but yeah, open. Uh, <laughs> maybe open as of tonight. I forgot to make the repo public, but that's OK. <laughs> One step, I forgot one step in the whole thing. That's okay. <laughs> like, I'm going to do it right before. It's cool. Um, but yeah, so in terms of like next steps, like I said, I want this to be open. So please, like, I want people to start contributing to it, things that are missing, new things that you've learned uh, potentially in your projects. Um, I'm also thinking that it might be helpful, and this might change, because I do want it to be community-centered. Um, look into GeoAI a little bit, but just, you know, there's definitely been some Promising applications that I've seen. Um, one plugin in particular helped with creating the boundaries in like PDF map pictures, um, whereas the other one was like a chat GPT type situation where you're like, here's the data, make me a map. Um, so hopefully, you know, that's got also kind of one of the things I hope for, that maybe this will prompt uh, the chat GPT GeoAIs of the world to ask different questions. Like I said, I want to go into time geography, do a little bit of Doctor Strange stuff, um, and data management as well. Um, I think with that one, um, kind of the people I talked to, they really varied. Uh, some people would have databases. Um, other people would be like, yeah, we just have a Google Drive. And then there was, of course, the one person that was like, yeah, our entire, system, our entire database was in a USB stick <laughs> connected to the computer, and I pulled it out, and now it's corrupted. <laughs> And it's a pretty, you know, it was a pretty large company, so it was kind of surprising. Um, so <laughs> I would like to do a little bit more research into some best practices around data management of GIS data. Um, and yeah, and kind of open it up to other people and potentially, you know, translate whatever needs to happen. Five minutes. ¿Podrías mostrar la primera este, lámina? Ahora la segunda. Ok, ahí está bien. Dices ahí la gran pregunta. ¿Cómo puede utilizar los sistemas de información geográfica con responsabilidad y ética para una justicia? del medio ambiente, ¿no? Yo estuve, yo estuve pensando durante toda la exposición. Yo creo que este, la justicia del medio ambiente tiene que ver más con dos cosas. Una, que no es una mercancía. Dos, que es un derecho. 
Y ese derecho tiene que ver con un bien común. Y que el problema es que intercambiamos el concepto de mercancía y derecho. Derechos y se venden se defienden. No sé si puedo traducirlo, pero I can kind of just essentially of like the concept of environmental justice. It's not. Dije si lo hice mal. It's not a product or a, yeah, like a product to be sold. It is a right. Bueno, ¿lo traducí bien? Sí, no. Yeah, so so, más o menos. <laughs> so so. Um, but yeah, no, I think to kind of uh, go on that as well, I think one of the things too as I was putting this together was who's the audience for this thing? Um, and quite often it wasn't necessarily like the people in an office trying to do something for a nonprofit, that could be it. Um, but quite often it was also communities. I think, you know, one of the things I forgot to mention was that um, a few of my early interviews before I even started the project, had communities come up to me, so I'm originally from Costa Rica, so there's a lot of development, a lot of like, you know, nature. Um, and it was basically an indigenous community that had collected a lot of uh, data that had a GIS component to it. Um, it got into the wrong hands. Now a developer has it, they're building something over it. Um, I'll be a resort, whatever it might be. Um, so that was the other thing too. I was like, if th this could also be something for communities to fight against, like, you know, like they might get a map, might be able to ask some questions. Um, but who knows? You know, this is very much the first iteration. Thank you so much for this presentation. I'm really curious about the time geography piece that you mentioned at the end. And so I'm just wondering if you can share a little bit more about what that might look like in the context. Um, yeah, so I mean, I will definitely say I'm still investigating it. I will, I could give some direction. And also on the platform itself, on the guide, there's a bunch of resources um, that people can like dig into. I will work on tagging them so it's better. I could tag it time geography for you. Um, but yeah, so one of the big things was that just, yeah, it really doesn't capture the complexity of being a human. It's very much, while GIS systems can let you kind of evolve, like let you evolve things, it doesn't do the human aspect of that. It can show you how land is evolving. Um, but not how people are moving around during that time, um, how the movement impacts the land or like the environment as well. Um, and so those are like kind of the major things. Um, some of the ones doing work on this are like, uh, I'm geographers, <laughs> that was a thing until now. Um, and you know, feminist geographers are two of the ones doing like really, really promising work around it. Potentially trying to do like create algorithms for these platforms. Um, but I will say like, it's very much an academic article, you're reading it, and you're like, okay, I'm gonna read that again. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's still kind of, it, it's in discussion, but I don't, I don't think it's kind of translated itself to the platform. I love the beginning of your presentation where you said um, that people use maps when they're unfamiliar with an environment. And one of the things that I find challenging about using maps to convey information and like, really build community is that once they poke around the first few times, no matter what the data set or information is, it's rare that you have people to come back and use it again and again because they sort of have this like spatial setting that they're now grounded in. Have you learned anything about uh, return usage or getting communities to use maps in this way that for like long-term usage? Um, I won't say necessarily return usage. I will say one of the things that was more consistent was they weren't necessarily for navigation. So people weren't necessarily like using it to try to remember where the Socalo is or whatever it might be. Um, they were definitely using it more to, you know, I think one of the big things I guess what we'll say is like the indigenous communities were using it to prove it against their government that this is their land. Um, so they already have it in their hands, but they just need to get a more formal uh, piece of paper that says, you know, that's not like, yeah, that's not their traditional ways of mapping. That is kind of like the way the government maps. Um, so I will say that they wouldn't necessarily go back to it because they already know it. Um, they just need to have something 
a receipt to show the government. Um, and I think in terms of like other things, since it's quite often mixed with human data, it doesn't stick. So they call it thematic maps, um, as opposed to like maps for navigation. Um, and so you know, it'd be, it's usually hard to remember where, like let's say COVID or let's say a smog or smoke situation. It's really hard to remember exactly where that was. You might remember that it's over your town, um, but you might not remember exactly how many towns over spot was. Um, so do, people do tend to come back to it a little bit more often. Um, they might remember their own location, though. I was curious if you could share some of the kind of epistemological or cultural biases that you saw in working with the GIS system. What, what other than coordinate systems, wasn't really being accounted for? Um, and I will say it goes a little bit more into the guide. It has a whole section on it. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so it was like the three major things. Uh, there was a coordinate systems, of course, which I can go into it, but essentially it's kind of like how we split up things and where we decide they are. Um, there's the models interchangeably. I think one of the things I forgot to share was um, this project gave me a lot of clarity or confirmed my lack of clarity because um, there was a lot of interchangeable words at times depending on the community you talk to. Um, but they have something in GIS called like datums of sorts uh, that are kind of models of the world. Um, and just for some context, the UK version of this model is off by five meters. So if you can imagine using the US version in the UK, it's gonna be off by even more. Um, so that's one. And quite often what happens is like, they're just preset and people don't really notice that they're off until the river is like another direction. <laughs> so that's usually what happens with most of them. I think uh, QGIS definitely is a little bit better, at least from my experience around like making sure that you choose the correct one before you get started. Um, but a lot of them are just like, we got you. We're gonna make some assumptions about this data that you just put in. Um, the other one too is, um, well this one's more about around security, um, GeoJSON, um, pretty much, take it a step back. Um, so one of the biggest projections, I think that many of us were taught in school, unfortunately, is the Mercator projection and it's the one that makes the US and Europe look bigger than everyone else. Okay, cool. Amazingly enough, that's the version that they decided to adapt for web maps, because it's cool. Um, <laughs> We're doing great. Um, but yeah, so it's a version that they use for web maps. So like that's the world that we continue to see and new generations will continue to see. Um, to top that off, web maps use quite often this version of data called GeoJSON. And those are actually not particularly secure. A lot of hackers can actually go in there, pull out the data. So if the person didn't go in there and take away personal information or whatever it might be, that's kind of at risk. Um, but yeah, there's, yeah, a, a lot of it is in the defaults that they set around the models. Thank you so much, Katy. Please give a warm applause to Katy.